Brian tells me that we've got to be out of here by eight, so I only have a little bit less than four hours. <laughs> oh man. What? Everybody knows how wordy. No, no, you eight, are. eight, eight's fine, Jay. <laughs> yeah. Use your time well. <laughs> Alright, so hop hogs to mayak shabu. Does everybody know what that means? No. Hog Samea is uh, happy happy feast day. Shavuot is today. Uh, means uh, uh, weeks. Uh, it comes from you know we counted seven weeks from the first Sabbath after unleavened bread began until tonight. Uh, well, today is the seventh Sabbath. Tonight is the fiftieth day. Shavuot is Hebrew for feast of weeks. Um, This morning, uh, you know, I, I spend just about every Sabbath morning, you know, watching videos on teaching or, or uh, you know, whatever. And this morning, I listened to some stuff about Bible translation that's maybe not so great. And uh, another teaching on Shavuot. Um, but I'm curious. We, I might have a YouTube addiction. <laughs> Is... Anybody else in the same boat? Sometimes. <laughs> what's, what's your favorite? Your favorite? You, whether it's YouTube or, or Vimeo or Rumble, whatever whatever platform you use, what's your favorite video channel? One more night ministry. Okay, it's a good one. Yeah. I don't have a problem. I can quit whenever I want. American <laughs> Cheating. <laughs> she's doing. She's doing better than me. Okay, well, I, I watch, um, one of my favorite ones is Science and Futurism with Isaac Arthur. Totally unrelated to anything, but, you know, I, I watch every single episode. And, you know, Mike Winger is the guy I was listening to this morning about uh, Bible translation. It's always great. Highly recommended. Um, I read books. I, if I'm standing in line at the grocery store, I'm reading a book. If I'm brushing my teeth, I'm reading a book. I. As long as I can remember, I have had a book in my hand at almost every opportunity. Now that I've got a phone with like three or four different book apps on it, I can read free or paid books. I finished this reading a novel yesterday and immediately downloaded the, the sequel and started reading that. I think I'm 20% through it already. Um, whether it's reading books, watching videos, listening to a podcast, watching TV. Anybody else watch TV? Tell me I'm not alone. <laughs> Um, there's there's bad stuff on TV, but you know it's not all totally evil. Um, we are bombarding ourselves constantly with some kind of input, whether it's entertainment or, or teaching or just information. It's constant info, info overload. Um, what does it have to do with Shavuot? Shavuot, by tradition, memorializes the giving of the Ten Commandments at Sinai. There's, no, there's nothing in scripture that says that explicitly. It doesn't say, keep this feast day to remember you know, when Moses went up on the mountain and got the Ten Commandments. It doesn't say that anywhere, it's just a tradition. But some of the things that Brian pointed out earlier, how when Moses came down from the mountain, they were worshiping the golden calf, 3,000 people were killed. At Pentecost, at the, you know, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, they're all speaking in tongues, 3,000 new people were added to the believers. There are other connections, like um, before Moses went up the mountain, he told everybody, stay down here, don't come up to the mountain, just stay here and wait. I'm gonna go up there, and he stayed up there 40 days. Of course, they, they didn't know about 40 day things, so they were, were a little concerned. Um, Yeshua, before he went up to heaven, after the resurrection, he stayed with the apostles for 40 days. And then he said, you guys all stay down here. I'm going up there. Sort of the reverse of Moses. There are, other, there are a lot of other parallels to That's not really the point of what I'm talking about. Just to point out that Pentecost and Sinai are both connected. They are both celebrations of Shavuot. We know for a fact that Pentecost was Shavuot because Pentecost is the Greek name for Shavuot. It means 50. Essentially, we're counting 50 days, which is the seven weeks plus one. Um, the commonality in both of these these events in Pentecost and at Shavuot, or at Sinai, 
is that God was speaking to men, to the people. Uh, he spoke to Moses or through Moses to the people, and he tried to speak directly to the people and put his laws on their hearts. At Pentecost, he spoke directly to the apostles and through them to all the people who were gathered in Jerusalem for the feast. Now, there's, I'm sure you've heard this before, that, you know, it's great to pray to God. Everybody prays at some time or another. There are no atheists in foxholes. Even atheists pray when they're really pressed. But people get concerned when you say God talks back. That's, <laughs> that's when people start to worry about you. But we know from Scripture that God does talk to us. He talks to Moses. He talks to the, he talks to the apostles. He talks to all of his people. And... You know, Paul and Moses both said that they wanted all the people to be prophets. Paul said that everybody should seek after the gift of prophecy. And when Joshua was, was so threatened by people in the camp prophesying and he went to Moses to complain, Moses said, no, don't stop them. I wish all the people would prophesy. So not only does God speak to us, but he wants to speak through us to the world, all of us. Doesn't mean that we all have the gift of prophecy, but he wants us all to seek it. And at some point, he wants us all to have it, even if we don't have it now. But we pray for healing, and we pray for jobs, we pray for family members to come to believe, you know, whatever troubles that are facing us. And sometimes we get answers to those prayers. Sometimes we have healings. Sometimes we find jobs, we find a home, find a parking space. Um, <laughs> but those are very specific things. But when Moses went up on the mountain and the apostles were waiting in that upper room, they had no idea what God was going to say to them. They, they were just supposed to listen. You know, the three, there are the three big holiday seasons in Torah. But well, there are really only two big holiday seasons, Passover and Sukkot. Everybody knows what's going on with those holidays. At Passover, we've got you know, all the preparation for the Seder, the lamb, and the, the seven days of unleavened bread. At Sukkot, Tabernacles, we've got you know, the, the tabernacles. Everybody's either camping or building a sukkah. Uh, there's lots of things that we associate, lots of things that we do surrounding those days. Shavuot gets kind of lost in the middle because nobody knows what it's about. You know, if, if, you're, if you're a little bit knowledgeable, then you know that, that it's about God speaking from Sinai. But what do we do? God didn't give us any instructions about what we're supposed to do at Shavuot. The priests have things to do. You know, there's there's the waving of the uh, of the grain offering and the lambs and you know, all these sacrifices. But the rest of us, God just said, go to Jerusalem, and then what? Well, that's the same thing that, that was going on with Israel and Moses and the apostles on that day. Yeshua told the apostles, go to Jerusalem and wait. So, if this day is about God speaking to us. We ought to be able to learn something from the scriptures about how God spoke to the people, how we can hear God's voice. I've never heard God speak to me audibly. I think that I've, that I've felt God telling me things on very rare occasions. But those are pretty rare. That doesn't happen except once every few years or, or something really significant. I think God is really telling me something. Um, some people certain, seem to hear God's voice a lot more than others. But I think that we all should. And I think maybe we can learn something from the way that, that God spoke to the people at Sinai and at Pentecost. So um, I know that we're going to read these passages in a little bit, but I want to read just little pieces of them right now. Uh, so somebody has a Bible. Turn to Exodus 19. Somebody who's willing to read out loud. Shout out or raise your hand or something when you're there. I'll read. Okay. Verses 9 through 15. 9 through 15? Yep. Okay. The Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will come to you in a thick cloud, so that the people may hear when I speak with you, and may also believe in you forever. Then Moses told the words, the words of the people to the Lord. The Lord also said to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow, and let them wash their garments, and let them be ready for the third day, 
For on the third day, the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. You shall, you shall set bounds for the people all around, saying, Beware that you do not go up to the mountain, up on the mountain, or touch the border of it. Whoever touches the mountain shall surely be put to death. No hand shall touch him, but he shall surely be stoned or shot through. Whether beast or man, he shall not live. When the ram's horn sounds a long blast, they shall come up to the mountain. So Moses went down from the mountain to the people and consecrated the people, and they washed their garments. He said to the people, Be ready for the third day. Do not go near a woman. That all sounds kind of dire. <laughs> it's like, it's like don't let anybody even touch the mountain or we're going to shoot them dead. Yeah, um, and don't touch a woman. Yeah. yeah, don't touch a woman. So what does that have to do with anything? Well, here are the things that God wanted the people to do. He wanted them to wash their clothes, to be sanctified. In other words, to live a separate life. Uh, that doesn't mean separate from all the other people because you're in a camp of a million people. You can't really go off by yourself. Um, but it does mean to live separately from the world. The, the cares of the world, the, the temptations, and all, the, all of the mess of the world. Um, he wanted them to be ritually pure, which is why, you know, don't, men don't stay away from your wives. It's not that there's anything wrong with being with your wife. It's that it makes you ritually impure. You can't go near the altar. And in this case, you can't go near the mountain of God in a state of ritual impurity. Remember, there's nothing sinful about being unclean. Uncleanness is simply a, it means that you've come into contact somehow with something related to death. So God doesn't want that in his presence. So if you're going to be in God's presence, you have to be in a state of ritual purity. Um, so washing the clothes, sanctification, uh, avoiding uncleanness, and then he gave them some restrictions. Don't come near the mountain. And they even drew a line and said, nobody cross this line or we will shoot you. So God set up some rules, some boundaries. That's essentially what we have in Torah. God set some boundaries, and some of those boundaries, he said, if you cross this, you will be killed. Um, and then, finally, he wanted them to wait. There was only one guy who was invited up to the top of the mountain, and that was Moses. Nobody else could take that role. So, in other words, God wanted people to be humble. Don't try to take Moses' place. You've got your role. Moses has his. You be content to wait here for word from God coming from Moses. All right, so let's compare that to what happened at Pentecost. So need somebody else to read. Another short passage. Brian, uh, Acts 2, or Acts 1, sorry. Acts chapter 1, verses 3 through 14. There's going to be one short one after that, too. After his death, he showed himself to them and gave many uh, convincing proofs that he was alive. During a period of 40 days, they saw him, and he spoke with them about the kingdom of God. At one of these gatherings, he instructed them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for the Father, what the Father had promised, which you heard about from me. For Yochanan used to immerse people in water, but in a few days you will be immersed in the rural Hakodesh. When they were together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore self-rule to Israel? He answered, you don't need to know the dates or the times. The Father has kept those under his own authority. But you will receive power when the Ruach HaKodesh comes upon you. You will be my witnesses both in Yerushalayim and in Yehuda and Shomron, indeed to the ends of the earth. After saying this, he was taken up before their eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. As they were staring into the sky after him, suddenly they saw two men dressed in white standing next to them. The men said, You Galileans, why are you standing, staring into space? This Yeshua, who has been taken away from you into heaven, will come back to you in just the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Then they returned the Shabbat walk distance from the Mount of Olives to Yerushalayim. After entering the city, they went to the stair upstairs room where they were staying. The names of the emissaries were Kepa, Yaakov, Yochanan, Andrew, Philip, Tamak, 
Bart, Tomai, Matityahu, Yaakov, Ben, Hophai, Shimon, and the Zealot, and Yehuda, Ben, Yaakov. Did you say 14? Yeah. These all devoted themselves single-mindedly to prayer along with some women, including Miriam, Yeshua's mother, and his brothers. Okay, was that the end? Yeah. Okay, thank you. And then one more, just uh, four verses from Acts 2, verses 1 through 4. I'll read it. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Thank you. Okay, so just like Mo God gave Moses instructions to give to the people when they were standing at the foot of Sinai, Yeshua gave his apostles instructions too. The first thing he told them was to wait. Go to Jerusalem and wait. Same thing that Moses told the people except at Sinai. Stay here at the bottom of the mountain and wait. Someone will come back down to tell you what's supposed to happen. Yeshua said, go to Jerusalem and wait, and the Spirit will come to you. And at the end of uh, Luke, in Luke chapter 24, it actually says that God will send you, or God will, will clothe you with new clothes. Uh, and it's a metaphor, of course, of new clothes of, of righteousness and power in the Holy Spirit. Uh, but it does go back to what Moses said to wash your clothes. And all through scripture washing, you know, having clean clothes is a metaphor for righteousness. To being forgiven and living a righteous life. So um, Yeshua said wait in Jerusalem. He said uh, the angels came and say, said why, why do you keep staring up into heaven? You know, you, you can't follow him. You need to just stay here. Which is a lot like what was happening at Sinai. Moses had the people Stay here. You can't be Moses. You can't go up there. Just stay here. Um, they were continually at the temple. Every day they were going to the temple to worship. That meant that they were all in a state of ritual purity. So they were staying away from their wives. They were staying away from things that would cause them to be impure so that they couldn't go to the temple. Uh, they were devoted to prayer. They spent, it was on the 40th day of counting the Omer that Yeshua went back to heaven. So they had 10 days from there until Shavuot that they went to the temple every day. They spent every day in prayer. They worshiped. I mean, we know that you know because of their discussion about replacing Judas that they discussed matters of the kingdom like how, how are we going to live now that you know in our new circumstances. And finally they were united. They were all together. They were not I'm sure that they were disagreements, but they were not spending all of their time arguing about which day Yeshua was coming back to tell them everything. Which day did Yeshua promise that the Spirit was coming? Is it going to be Shavuot? Is that the big day? Maybe it was, maybe it wasn't, but they didn't spend all their time arguing about it. Maybe they examined scriptures and spent some time talking. But they spent all their time devoted to prayer and worship for 10 days. So why don't we hear from God? Well, the disciples in, in you know, these 120 people who were waiting, they didn't have YouTube, they didn't have Netflix, they didn't have podcasts, they didn't even have any books. They spent this time just them and God. When was the last time that you had 10 days of nothing but prayer and worship, spending time with God? Have you ever done that? What about three days, like a sign up? Some of us might have done that, spending three days fasting, maybe well, maybe fasting, praying, worshiping. I know as a kid, I used to go to church camp. It was five days with nothing but uh, spending time with other believers, spending time in prayer, worship, Bible study. And those were the times that I remember most feeling closest to God and feeling like God was about to speak to me. Whether he was or not, maybe that was just, you know, just youth? I don't really know. But that's the closest I've ever come to what the Bible describes happened at Sinai and at Pentecost. And I think that 
this constant flood of input that we have, whether, it's, whether you're reading, whether it's the news, television, it's deafening us. We are, we are becoming immune to hearing the voice of God because we're filling our heads and our hearts and our ears with so many other voices, there's no room left for God to speak. And I think that if we're really going to hear the voice of God, I am speaking of myself as much as anybody else. Um, if, we're really, if we really want to hear from God, we need to emulate what the apostles and what Israel did at those great Shavuot. We need to be very intentional about spending time with God. We need to set apart specific times not just an hour, not just a few hours on Saturday afternoon, days, multiple days in a row. Set that time apart to spend you, your family, your community, whoever, but with God, with no interruptions. Everybody's got to eat, everybody's got to bathe, we hope. Um, but you don't have to turn the TV on. You don't have to check your email. You don't have to do all these things that the world is demanding that you give your attention to. And I think that if we, if we are able to do that, to set aside some very intentional, specific time with God, 10 days would be amazing. I don't know if I could do it. Maybe we need to work our way up to that. Start with one day, then move up to two and three. But I think if we can really do that, spend that kind of focused time with just us and God, at some point we can't help but hear God's voice. He is trying to speak to us. We just can't hear him. It's not that we don't want to. We just can't. Thank you. Thank you.